you very much for giving me the opportunity to present 2022 report produced by Institute of Public Policy uh, named after me. Uh, let me, I wrote down a few points, so I'll just uh, read them out, which is probably the best way to go. Uh, radical Islam gets the blame for the poor treatment of women in many parts of the Muslim world. As I discuss in the chapter that deals with the restriction placed on women in Afghanistan run by the Taliban, Islam has been misinterpreted by those who took over the control of the country more than a year ago. Women in Afghanistan have seen their activities constrained in many ways. But Afghanistan is not the only country that has gone that way. The other is Saudi Arabia, where women were not permitted to drive. They received the permission to be at the wheel a few months ago when Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman allowed driving permits to be given to women in his country. However, Islam is not the only religion that has treated women so poorly. The practice of burning or burying alive widows of deceased Hindu husbands was banned in 1829 when India was still governed by the East India Company. Up to that point, this was a centuries old practice. Governor General Williams Bentinck took the decision to ban the practice in all jurisdictions of India. While that was an extreme example of the cruelty inflicted on women, discrimination against women in some form or other is still practiced by Hindus. It took a de decision by the Indian Supreme Court to allow women to enter some temples. They had to wait outside while their male relatives prayed inside. In other words, it took state action to remove the most egregious practices against the human rights of women in the Hindu society. I will have a bit more to say about the state's role in improving women's status in several backward societies. This is the case not only in Muslim societies. A few years ago, while spending my summers in Singapore's National University's Institute of South Asian Studies, I was assigned a young Bangladeshi economist to work with me as my research assistant. One day he came to me and said that he had found out that a, that a couple of economics professors at Harvard University had a large database on education in South Asia which he could access. I told him to prepare some tables for me on the proportion of young girls who were enrolled in primary schools and the proportion that stayed in school for the entire five-year period. This was to be done for, for Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. He brought in the results that surprised me since they went against popular belief. Girls in Pakistan were doing much better than, the, than in the other two countries. I asked him to give me the separate information for public and private sector institutions. The private sector was doing much better than those managed by the state. I then consulted some sociologists who were at the institution, and they told me that a significant number of women who were receiving remittances from their relatives working abroad had invested in establishing education institutions in their homes. These were modest one to two rooms establishment for educating girls of primary school age. Women who had made this investment had some education and in most cases they were the only teachers in these modest institutions. Women's role in promoting education is not confined to the countryside. They have also invested in building and running high level institutions. One example of that is Beacon House National University, which is now the largest multi-city college institution in the country. It was set up and is run by a female entrepreneur. This brings me to the role of the state 
and how it can be augmented by the private sector. One example is from the Lahore-based Berkey Institute of Public Policy, which has launched a scholarship program that, was, that would finance education in technology and the health sector for girls who are relatively poor families in Lahore. My family and I have made significant contribution to finance this effort. We are also being helped by some United States-based Pakistani expatriates. We hope that well-to-do Lahore citizens will come forward and help this program to grow in size. With these brief words, I would like to introduce our report for 2022, which deals entirely with the role women play in economic development. Thanks for giving me the time.